Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, Episode 7, Project Mercury Flight 5, Sigma 7, The Textbook Flight. Last time, we talked about the flight of Scott Carpenter on Aurora 7. While the mission was a success, it was troubled by an overly packed slate of science experiments, a poorly planned mission sequence, frequently changing mission plan, and numerous minor mistakes and deviations from the flight plan by astronaut Scott Carpenter. Aurora 7 became the second NASA manned orbital flight to return to Earth with empty fuel tanks, raising questions about basic safety of the pilots, as well as hopes for longer duration missions. In addition to a somewhat rocky mission, the flight was punctuated by a confused response by recovery forces following the off-target landing. Aurora 7 was actually located by Air Force spotter planes several hours before the Navy was able to recover the spacecraft and its pilot. Inter-service rivalry and confusion over the exact responsibilities of various recovery forces resulted in a far longer than necessary wait for Carpenter and the two rescue divers who joined him shortly after splashdown. As part of the immediate response to the aftermath of Aurora 7, an effort was made to better coordinate between the Navy, Air Force, and NASA during upcoming missions. With the new changes, mission controllers could communicate instantly with all branches of the recovery effort. Spaceflight was complicated enough already, and nobody wanted to see an astronaut potentially harmed by the various organizations involved failing to adequately share information. Additionally, an extension cord for the onboard radio was added to future capsules so that the astronaut could remain in contact with recovery forces even while waiting in his life raft. In contrast to the science-heavy flight of Aurora 7 on Mercury Atlas 7, Mercury Atlas 8 was to focus on engineering. One of the early goals of Project Mercury was to fly a man for 18 orbits, a mission that would take a full day. This was dropped in favor of the three-orbit goal that John Glenn accomplished in early 1962, but it was still very much on the minds of the Project Mercury leadership. 18 orbits is a big leap from three, however, especially when both three-orbit flights came home running on fumes. Mercury Atlas 8 would fill the gap by flying a spacecraft modified for longer duration and with a mission plan that emphasized conservation of onboard resources. The pilot for Mercury Atlas 8 was perhaps a little less conservative, at least in personality. Walter Wally Schirra was born on March 12, 1923, in Hackensack, New Jersey. He was born with aviation already in his blood. His father was a pilot who flew bombing and reconnaissance missions in the skies over Germany during World War I, and who went on to perform at county fairs across the country as a barnstormer. His mother performed alongside her husband by demonstrating her daring in a series of wing walk stunts. With a family like that, it is perhaps not surprising that Shira was only 15 years old when he took to the sky in his father's airplane. Between 1942 and 1945, he attended the United States Naval Academy and was commissioned as an officer. He served aboard the USS Alaska during the final months of World War II. Following the war, he trained as a naval aviator and became only the second Navy pilot to chalk up a thousand hours behind the controls of jet aircraft. Like several of his fellow astronauts, he also served in the Korean War, flying 90 combat missions. Also like several of his fellow astronauts, after the Korean War he became a test pilot. At one point while testing the Sidewinder homing missile, the weapon malfunctioned and Wally had to evade his own missile. I suppose there's a reason they only let the best pilots do these kinds of things. As a Project Mercury astronaut, Shira focused on the life support and environmental control systems of the vehicle and spacesuit. The choice was a fortunate one, as we will soon see. Shira served as the backup pilot for John Glenn's flight on Mercury Atlas 6, and then for Scott Carpenter on Mercury Atlas 7. Now it was his turn. Shira was far from the only astronaut waiting in line at this point. In addition to Deke Slayton, who had been removed from flight status due to minor heart condition, and Gordon Cooper, who had yet to fly in Project Mercury, the second group of astronauts joined NASA in September 1962, shortly before Shira's flight. The so-called New Nine was drawn from the same pool of extremely talented military and former military test pilots as the Mercury 7. We'll have plenty of time to cover each of these fascinating pilots when their flights come, but I'm going to quickly rattle off their names, and I think you'll hear a few familiar ones in there. In alphabetical order, Neil Armstrong, Frank Borman, Pete Conrad, Jim Lovell, Jim McDivitt, Elliot C., Tom Stafford, Ed White, and John Young. Quite a lineup. In order to have any hope of completing a six-orbit flight, 
let alone the 18 orbits required to spend a full day in space, a number of engineering challenges needed to be overcome. The top issues were the rate of attitude control system fuel use, longevity of the batteries that powered the spacecraft systems, the rate at which air leaked from the capsule, which isn't as scary as it sounds, and, as always, the weight of the vehicle. All of these issues were knocked out one by one in what I can only imagine as a way nerdier Rocky-style montage. These fixes were accompanied by a tweaking of the attitude control system. It was made more difficult to activate the high-powered thrusters when in fly-by-wire mode, since they used a lot of fuel and didn't seem to be necessary. Future astronauts would control their ships with short, crisp bursts issued via the newly tuned fly-by-wire system. Small weight savings were made here and there, including the removal of the lower part of the astronaut couch in favor of a more comfortable restraint system, removal of the astronaut observer camera, and some now unnecessary voice communications equipment. But on the top of the list of potential weight savings was the periscope. At a whopping 76 pounds, and with dubious utility, it seemed like a perfect way to save a good chunk of weight. Scott Carpenter had insisted that the device was useless at night and barely worthwhile in general. However, Carpenter had also landed several hundred miles off course, partially due to a substantial drift in yaw that perhaps could have been avoided had he used his periscope instead of indicators on the spacecraft window. Begrudgingly, McDonnell engineers retained the heavy contraption, and Shira was instructed to more thoroughly put it through its paces during his longer mission. I've always found the periscope to be pretty funny, and really representative of how new the realm of spaceflight was at the time. In retrospect, it's obvious that a nice big window would be far preferable to the strange little distorted view provided by the periscope, but at the time, who knew? In addition to tightening up some aspects of the flight, some other aspects were loosened to accommodate the six-orbit mission. To help save fuel, the acceptable drift ranges in the automatic mode were widened. The requirement to have no more than 10-minute long gaps without astronaut communication was also relaxed, and Shira would go as long as 30 minutes without contact with Earth. One persistent problem was electricity. Spaceships run on electricity, and batteries are heavy, but rather than add more batteries to satisfy the increased demand, Mercury engineers decided to simply reduce the demand. For long portions of the flight, Shira would power down parts of his spacecraft and enter into an unguided drift mode. Using this technique promised to save both electricity and the all-important attitude control fuel. Lastly, a few small items were added to the flight due to a bizarre and oh 60s problem. As part of the Operation Dominic series of nuclear weapons tests, 1962 saw a number of high-altitude and space-based nuclear detonations. These blasts ranged as high as 1.4 megatons on the Starfish Prime test, which was bright enough to light up clouds in Hawaii, 1,300 kilometers away. These tests created the temporary artificial band of radiation around the Earth to accompany the natural Van Allen radiation belts, and made the region for human spaceflight just a little more complicated. NASA was assured that the radiation levels had dropped enough for a safe manned mission, but just to be sure, both spacecraft and astronaut were outfitted with several small radiation detectors. The capsule was ready, but another lesson to come from Aurora 7 was that the mission plan needed some work. It seems unthinkable today, but the Aurora 7 experiments were not arranged with an eye on the overall mission. Each task required what seemed like a reasonable amount of the astronaut's time, but when strung together prevented him from effective housekeeping and upkeep of his spacecraft. Additionally, little thought was given to the sequencing of the experiments. Perhaps spoiled from testing on experimental aircraft, where attitude changes can be made without a second thought, experiments with completely different attitude requirements were placed near each other in sequence. Essentially, Carpenter was asked to point at 12 o'clock, then 5 o'clock, then 11 o'clock, swinging back and forth, instead of allowing one smooth series of motions from 11 to 12 to 5. With Shiraz's flight, more emphasis was placed on autonomous experiments to keep the astronauts' workload down, as well as being more considerate about arranging experiments in a rational order. Carpenter was also hampered by the ever-changing flight plan. Changes were made frequently all the way up to just days before the launch itself. This made effective training impossible. In contrast, Shira was presented with the final mission plan with months, not days, remaining to study it, with only minor changes made as the launch approached. Okay, so that covers the spacecraft, the procedures, and the astronaut. All good to go, right? Not quite yet. 
Since the Earth rotates underneath an orbiting spacecraft, each time it passes the equator, its ground track will shift about 1,500 miles to the west. This is why John Glenn passed over Africa during the early part of his first orbit, but splashed down off the coast of Florida during the same part of his third orbit. With the six orbits of Mercury Atlas 8, the recovery area shifted to the Pacific Ocean. But since an abort would still result in an Atlantic splashdown, recovery forces were needed in both oceans. 28 ships and over 17,000 servicemen would be out in force to support the flight and its pilot. To represent the summation of all the effort required to make this engineering flight a success, Sherrod chose the name Sigma-7 for his spacecraft, with Sigma being the mathematical symbol for summation. On October 3rd, 1962, both Sigma-7 and Wally Sherrod were ready. Sherrod was awoken at 1.40 a.m. and went through the usual routine, but with the added flair of breakfast including a bluefish that he speared himself the previous day. At 4.41 a.m., he entered his spacecraft and discovered a car key hanging from his hand controller safety pin and a steak sandwich in a side compartment. Ah, spacecraft pranks. One set of keys and steak sandwich lighter, Booster, spacecraft, and astronaut rose from the launch pad at 7.15 a.m., with Shara relaying, I have the liftoff and she feels real nice. The mission nearly came to an end shortly afterwards, when an alarming roll placed the vehicle close to abort conditions but to the relief of all involved, the Atlas 113D rocket soon corrected the anomalous movement. The ride was smooth, but louder than expected, with the roaring noise on board the capsule overwhelming the microphone activation threshold and forcing Shara to choose between being unable to hear messages from mission control or taking his hand off the abort handle and activating the microphone manually when he wished to speak. He chose the latter, and thankfully the abort handle proved unnecessary. The boost stage cut out two seconds earlier than expected, but the sustainer engine more than compensated for the deficit and actually left the capsule with slightly more speed than desired. Sigma-7 would fly higher and faster than any other Mercury capsule, if only by a bit. After the sustainer engine shut down, the spacecraft separated from the launch vehicle. Shara switched to fly-by-wire and performed a slow, but efficient, turnaround maneuver over the course of 45 seconds. In an early indication of how successful the flight would prove to be, the turnaround used only about a tenth of the fuel as previous flights. Like his predecessors, Sherrod tracked the silvery atlas through his window as it tumbled away from him. With his newly tuned thrusters, he had no difficulty tracking the launch vehicle, and commented that he believed orbital rendezvous of two-manned spacecraft should be doable. I'm getting ahead of myself again, but he turned out to be right, and went on to command Gemini 6, the first manned mission to rendezvous with another manned spacecraft, Gemini 7. The astronaut next tried the manual proportional system, which again is the purely mechanical valve-based system, and much like Grissom, he found it to be sluggish and sloppy. He greatly preferred the snappy fly-by-wire system. The early portion of the flight was going smoothly when a potentially mission-ending problem began to emerge. The astronaut's suit began to get warmer, and then uncomfortably hot. While mission controllers debated the merits of ending the flight after just one orbit, Shara put his knowledge from his specialized environmental system training to good use. He had learned that it was best to make slow adjustments, allowing the system to settle down before changing it again. Carpenter too had encountered suit temperature issues, but made large changes to the cooling system control knobs, inducing great swings of temperature. Shara, instead, would turn the knob half a level, wait 10 minutes, then turn it again. This measured approach eventually resulted in the desired temperature and kept the system from oscillating out of control or overexerting itself and freezing over. Mission controllers, seeing the slow stop and eventual reversal of the rising temperature, allowed the mission to proceed. Between working the issue with his suit temperature and troubleshooting some minor communications issues, Shara found himself on the other side of the world in orbital darkness before he knew it. He once again attempted to view a flare fired from the surface, but once again, cloudy weather prevented it. I'm pretty sure that flare experiment is just cursed or something. While he couldn't see the flare, he was treated to a different kind of light show, a thunderstorm. Shara said he was able to clearly see lightning, but instead of jagged bolts, he saw sudden blobs of light as the electric discharge lit up the clouds around it for miles in all directions. As he soared through his first night in space, Shara attempted to use the periscope to judge his spacecraft's attitude. He relayed his report using highly technical jargon. Quote, I couldn't see schmatch through it. 
Schmatz translated means nothing. End quote. So much for the periscope. The weight-conscious engineers working on the upcoming Mercury Atlas 9 were delighted to be rid of it. Returning to daylight, Shara wrapped up his first orbit in space, having only used a minuscule 1.4 pounds of fuel. Clearly the fuel-saving efforts were paying off. After the off-nominal retrofire of Aurora 7, one of the main tasks of Sigma 7 was to determine the best ways to ascertain the spacecraft's yaw angle. Shara found it a simple task of tracking features of the Earth outside the window. Even in cloudy conditions, it was possible to pick out particular features of the clouds, such as a rising thunderhead, and use it for reference. Night proved to be trickier. The air glow layer meant that determining pitch and roll was fairly simple, but since it lacked any features, it wasn't very useful for Yaw. There were hopes that the astronaut could use the backdrop of stars to help orient him, and Shara was able to successfully achieve this, but it took a fair amount of effort with the small window. The pilot preferred to set his desired yaw angles in the daylight when possible. Speaking of daylight, as the spacecraft passed from night into day, Shara reported that he also saw John Glenn's fireflies. They swirled around him as he spoke with Glenn, who was serving as the California Capcom. He commented, It's kind of hard to describe all this, isn't it, John? During his third orbit, Shara began to power down elements of his spacecraft in order to attempt drifting flight. The test was contingent upon a successful yaw determination exercise, but since there were no problems there, with even the night side observations being close enough, the drifting experiment got the green light. During this time, Shara used his handheld camera to snap photos of weather systems and whatever else he thought looked interesting. In contrast to many astronauts over the years, he commented that he was not overly impressed with the view. He compared it to the view from any high-altitude aircraft, saying in his debriefing, Same old deal, nothing new. Might as well be in an airplane at 40 to 50,000 feet altitude. It seems he was also somewhat unimpressed by the constant management required by the communications procedures. In later space missions, the crew would only speak with Houston. Their conversations may be received by stations all over the world, but were all eventually relayed to the Manned Space Flight Center in Texas. Mercury communications were not nearly as continuous. The various ground stations were able to communicate with each other via phone lines or teletype machines, but were largely independent. This meant that the astronaut was essentially making a never-ending series of brief phone calls with Capcom spread all around the world. I can't really blame him for getting tired of this over the course of nine hours. Sigma-7 passed over the Indian Ocean, a Shara radio to the tracking ship stationed there that he had successfully powered up his spaceship again and was no longer in drifting flight. The Capcom on board the ship acknowledged the report and said that the crew had actually spotted the diminutive spacecraft as it had passed overhead. So far, the mission was going great. Fuel use was even better than hoped for, Shara's suit temperature was under control, the yaw experiments had worked well, and even the radiation dosimeters reported no issues. With Hawaii sliding past his window, Shara was given the good news that he had been given the go-ahead for the full six-orbit duration. Shortly afterwards, he had a conversation with John Glenn that was broadcast live to the nation. Shara reported that he was having a wonderful time and that his spacecraft was performing beautifully. In fact, the spacecraft was performing so well that there really even wasn't much to report. Shara later said it was his first chance to relax since December. As his final orbit drew to a close, and the time for retrofire approached, Shara found himself in a very different situation than Scott Carpenter. His spacecraft was in the proper attitude, his pre-retrofire checklist was complete, and his fuel tanks were still nearly 80% full. Retrofire occurred right on time, and Shara said he was impressed that the vehicle stayed so steady during the maneuver. At the behest of Mercury engineers, the astronaut then switched control of the capsule over to the RSCS, or Rate Stabilization Control System, for re-entry. I briefly covered this in a previous episode, but this rarely used control mode allowed the astronaut to control the rate of rotation of his vehicle, as opposed to directly controlling the thrusters. So, for instance... If the pilot were to roll the stick to the left and then return to center, the spacecraft would perform a roll proportional to the amount of stick deflection and then stop when the stick returned to center, performing all thruster firings necessary for such a motion. If the astronaut performed the same maneuver using the fly-by-wire or manual proportional systems, the spacecraft would continue to roll as the hand controller was returned to the neutral position. It would only stop if the astronaut made an opposite rolling motion to the right to cancel it out. 
Shira was not a big fan of the RSCS, since it churned through the fuel he had worked so hard to maintain at an alarming rate. The engineers had hoped this mode would prove useful during re-entry, but its thirst for fuel made it impractical. With plenty of fuel on board, Shira was not forced to endure the wild oscillations of his predecessors during atmospheric re-entry. While drifting down under his parachute, he dumped the remaining fuel, nearly half of what he started with, so recovery crews wouldn't have to worry about the toxic substance. 9 hours, 13 minutes, and 15 seconds after liftoff, Sigma-7 splashed down 4.5 miles from the aircraft carrier tasked with recovering it. The engineer who had calculated the retrofire time remarked that the carrier must have been off-target. After splashdown, the whip antenna deployed, and Shira joked that he thought he might spear another bluefish. Shira was perfectly comfortable in the spacecraft turned sea craft and requested to stay in the vehicle during recovery. Sigma-7 was fitted with a flotation collar, towed to the aircraft carrier, and then hoisted on board. The ship crew stood back and Shira activated the explosive hatch. In the process, he received the same superficial hand injury from the plunger as Glenn had, and Grissom had not. Carpenter, of course, never hit the plunger, since he elected to use the nose cone egress route. After nine hours in space, Shira seemed to suffer no serious ill effects. His lower legs appeared dark and dusky due to blood pooling in his lower extremities, and after standing following a tilt table test, his heart rate became slightly elevated, but both of these conditions returned to normal by the following day. Much like its pilot, Sigma-7 was also found to be in excellent condition, such that the inspectors couldn't really find much wrong with it. The suit cooling issues turned out to be due to some dried-out silicone lubricant on a valve in the system. Can't win them all, I guess. The flight of Sigma-7 was in almost every way a perfect orbital mission. There were no erroneous and dangerous telemetry signals leading to a dramatic entry like on Friendship 7, there were no issues with the workload or pilot distractions like on Aurora 7. The flight had proven without a doubt that the path was clear to proceed with the one-day mission. And in many ways, Sigma-7 was the last flight in Project Mercury. The spacecraft for the following flight had to be modified so extensively that some considered it to be the first and only flight in a manned one-day mission project, as opposed to the more limited Project Mercury. The textbook flight re-energized the NASA workforce, but was soon overshadowed in the public by the Cuban Missile Crisis, which began less than two weeks later. While the Kennedy administration worked to avert a nuclear war, NASA worked to accomplish a goal it previously thought was unattainable, orbiting a human for a full 24 hours. So join me in two weeks for the final flight in Project Mercury, Faith 7. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.